I'm Sandy Eller for Vin News at the Museum of Jewish Heritage for the fourth annual Orthodox Jewish All-Star Awards presented by Jew in the City. Jew in the City was founded in 2007 by Allison Josephs to provide greater understanding of Orthodox Judaism and those who practice it. Tonight's honorees are being recognized for their achievements and accomplishments, proving that professional success and a Torah lifestyle can indeed go hand in hand. We're talking to Allison Josephs, founder of Jew in the City. Tell me how Jew in the City has evolved since you started it and how it has surpassed your expectations. Okay, so when I started it, um, it was just me, you know, um, making some videos and writing a blog and hoping that it would catch on. And over time, volunteers started accumulating. And um, we filed a year and a half ago as a 501c3. Um, and probably one of our biggest, uh, you know, points of growth is uh, Project Makom. Uh, we are giving now an alternative to leaving the ultra Hasidish Haredi world altogether. A lot of people have seen the stories, the memoirs of people who had a very extreme life in the Jewish world and who just left it all behind. And people actually came to us who were from that community and saw the brand of orthodoxy we were putting out there and said, we want this too, how do we get that? And so it was never the intention. The intention was to show secular Jews you can be in the world and you can have a meaningful life. But what ended up happening was that Jews that were living a, you know, a life with halacha and Torah mitzvot, but did not have as much access to the world, said we want this balance too. And so with Project Makum now, um, we are opening up a lot of new possibilities and Baruch Hashem connecting a lot more Jews, uh, I think, in an authentic way. Is this the first year that you're running a Chinese auction in conjunction with your awards? This is the first year that we're running this auction. Um, you know, we make this party for first and foremost for Kiddush Hashem to just give people inspiration um, to show the non-observing crowd that if you want to grow in your observance that you don't have to think that you're going to be held back in your career. Not in every industry, but in a whole bunch. We want to show young from kids you can have big dreams. You don't have to think that you have to be in a small box. You know, to, to be from that, if you have some crazy dream, a lot of the times you can work it in with a, a lifestyle of Torah mitzvot. But at the same time, we also need to raise money because our programming is growing, our needs are growing. Um, we're putting out a new website, we're putting out a bunch of new videos. And so um, with the All-Stars auction, we have this really amazing um, array, now 40 All-Stars, who ha are donating either their time or a service or, you know, some, you know, some item that's connected with their brand. And so we're hoping that, you know, it will help us raise some money to, to keep on uh, expanding our work. How do you choose your All-Stars? So we have a, uh, a committee, a, a panel. And we have nominations open for about a month and a half after Pesach. I can't believe it's happening so soon. I can't believe I just said that, but that is the truth. Um, and the truth is that all year round, people are just sending us names. And our committee is keeping an eye out for names and, you know, tips all year round. So um, the thing is that, like, the bad guys, the crooks, creeps, and extremists, they make the headlines with no one trying to get them to make the headlines. When they make the headlines, we all go, ay vey, right? So the people that are doing good things usually just stay under the radar. And maybe they don't always want the, the publicity that we give them. They, a lot of them are really quite humble people that like to kind of, you know, lay on the down low. And we kind of say to them, you know what, the Jewish people need you. They need you to just sort of step forward now and let them know this is possible because it just gives so much inspiration. Okay, we are talking to Alana Wernick, who is an Emmy Award winning producer of television series. I want to ask you, nice girl growing up in Queens. Long Island. Long Island. Close enough. Sorry, Lawrence, Hav, and Hafta, right? Yes, yes. How did you get to Hollywood? Okay, well, that's a good question. Um, I started in journalism, and I really didn't like that. And I thought, well, I love TV shows, I love sitcoms, so I tried writing those, and thank God other people liked my writing. And one thing led to another, and here I am. What was it like when you won an Emmy Award? People don't even contemplate that. Uh, it was very surreal. It was about as surreal as you would imagine. It's, you really, it's kind of like your wedding day, where you have to really focus on the faces around you because it all goes by in a blur. So it was very, very exciting. And I understand at one year's awards ceremony, you got up there with the whole crew from Modern Family, and you were the only, one, only woman there wearing sleeves. Yes, I think I was the only woman wearing sleeves. What was that like? Was that a moment of personal pride, saying, this is who I am, and I'm not going to be defined by the outside world? Yes. I, I, I mean, there was no question I was going to wear sleeves on my dress. And my dress designer kept saying, oh, because, you know, you don't put sleeves on until the very end. So he said, oh, but it looks so good, sleeveless, strapless, looks so good. I said, I can't, I can't do that. So yeah, it was not even a question for me. And that's just, it was, it was just that simple. 
How do you deal with things? I know sitcoms tape on a Friday night, so you're basically the most important part of the week. You're saying, bye guys, I gotta leave for Shabbos. How does that work for you, and are people resentful? Um, thank God no one has been resentful. I find that if you're very good at your job, and you're very sincere in what your beliefs are, no one is resentful, and thank God, I think, so far, I've been good at my job, and uh, when I was working at the King of Queens, they did tape on Friday nights, but they respected what I brought to the table the rest of the week, and in fact, they, the last taping, they made on a Thursday night just so I could be there, the taping of the finale, so that was very special. That's really special. One last question. Sure. What would you say to teenage girls who have big dreams that some might say are not so practical, but they look and say, this is where I want to go? What would you tell them? I would say, can I speak directly to camera? Okay, I would say if you are good at something and you know you're good at it, go for it. Do not compromise on who you are or your beliefs. Don't do it. Bennett Wernick. Okay, and your daughter Alana is an Emmy Award winning television producer, executive producer. What were your thoughts when your daughter first told you, Dad, I'm going to Hollywood? I said, Kala Kavod. She was always strong in her beliefs, so I had no problem with that. She knows who she is, she knows where she comes from, and she knows where she's going. So we had no problem with that. I, I'm one of the few parents that wanted her to be what she wanted to be. I only went as far as Purim Torah, but she went all the way, and can I know her? It's, it's a beautiful thing, and the, it, the, the Nachas comes not from that she's an Emmy-winning comedy writer, but that she's an Emmy-winning comedy writer that is Shomer Shabbos. And that, that is an... It's, a, it's an inspiration. She spoke in our shuls. She had a bigger crowd than all the Rabbanim. And all. Yeah, because people are into that and they learn from somebody when they could see they could be whatever they want and still be orthodox. To Baroness Rosalind Altman, who is the pensions minister in the United Kingdom and has been described by Prime Minister David Cameron as the country's leading expert on many, many matters of financial interest. I understand that as a youngster, you always rooted for the underdog and would bring home maybe stray animals that needed help and things. How did that carry through as you progressed in your career to work beyond that and to help people in the United Kingdom? Well, I think I've always had this sense that we want to help each other. I want to help people. What are we here in this world for? I don't believe we're here just for ourselves. I think there is a wider responsibility that we all have, which is really what my parents instilled into me. Uh, I guess also, I maybe it's a natural Jewish thing to try and help people to have compassion, to look after those who are less fortunate or in some way need help. You don't turn your back on people who need help. You actually go out of your way to try and help them. And I think that comes very loud and clear through Judaism and from the Torah, really. You know. It can manifest itself in lots of different ways, but I do think that that is something that comes from a deep religious belief. A lot of times when you hear the word pensions, most people are thinking about companies that are funding pensions and the business aspect. My understanding is that you see pensions from the other side, the person who's waiting for that check, the person who's getting that money. Do you think that that's influenced your career and has it um, earned you detractors from people in the business world to look and say, hey, she's messing with us? Actually, you're absolutely right. I f see pensions as not just about money. Pensions are about people. It's people who need that money to live on in later life. And one of the big campaigns that I ran a few years ago was trying to help people who had lost their entire company pension because there was a flaw in the UK law which had taken their money away from them. It hadn't been done deliberately, but it was happening. A lot of people in the pensions industry, when I was highlighting how this had affected people whose life savings had just disappeared and they were coming up for retirement and had nothing to live on, was, you know, I was vilified. Don't rock the boat, don't undermine confidence. They didn't get the fact that if you've got a pension system that can leave people with no pension, that is not a good pension system. That's one that's in need of reform. It took me a while to get people on side, to get people to see that actually it's not just about keeping the money flowing. This is about making sure that the people at the end of the day get the pensions that they are expecting as much as possible. Yes, there's risk, of course, and you need some insurance or protection, 
But if you forget about the people at the end of it, then I don't think pensions are worth bothering with. I don't think there's been another Orthodox Jewish woman who has made it to the House of Lords. How have you had to deal with your, how have you managed to sync your religious observance with the very prestigious position that you're holding in the government? There are other Orthodox Jews in the House of Lords, but I believe I'm the first Shomer Shabbat UK government minister. There's not been a Shomer Shabbat, fully kosher, Orthodox Jewish minister in the UK government before. But I must admit that I think from my perspective, the UK government itself has been amazingly tolerant, accommodating. There's never been a problem really respectful of the fact that I am an Orthodox Jew and accommodating Shabbat, Kashrut, not a problem. And I feel very fortunate to live in a country that is able to allow people like myself to be fully part of the secular world as well as having our religious observance. How does one become a Baroness and what, title, what privileges come along with that title? Well, if you don't inherit a title, and of course I didn't, my parents were refugees from the Holocaust, then actually you need to be appointed to the House of Lords by the Prime Minister and the Queen. And that's the way I have managed to get into the House of Lords. I got a phone call saying, would you, we would like you to... Uh, or we'd like to put you into the House of Lords. And then you have to go through a, a bit of a process and the Queen has to approve you. And the privileges that come with it are really the privileges of being in the House of Lords. I mean, it is the most amazing place. It's the most beautiful building. It has the best library I've ever seen. But also, we make the law. We are a, a chamber, a body in the government that checks on the House of Commons, makes sure that the laws that are being started or uh, passed through the Commons are actually going to work well, send it back if it doesn't work properly. And, I don't know, it is obviously an amazing privilege. There are all sorts of uh, opportunities within the House of Lords to meet the, you know, the top people in, in their fields. The House of Lords is full of experts each in their own field, who have been recognized by the government and the monarchy as being leaders in their field. And it, it is really an amazing honor. What went through your head when you got that phone call? I couldn't quite believe it. And when I told my husband that I'd just had this phone call, he said, it's a wind up. You know, it, it was just quite, quite one of these surreal moments when you sort of put down the phone and you think, Am I dreaming? Did that really happen? Did you, do you now get wedding invitations addressed to your house that are addressed to Mr. and Baroness Altman? Well, I've kept my name. Okay. So my husband has a different name. But I must admit that there is a flaw in this because if I was a man and I became a lord, which is the equivalent, my wife would be lady. I'm a woman, I've become a baroness. My husband is nothing. My children are the honourable, they're all the honourable, really? yeah. but the husband of a baroness is nothing. It's very odd and it's very discriminatory against men. My husband's going to stand outside the Houses of Parliament with a placard saying equal <laughs> rights for men. <laughs> Wonderful. We are speaking to her by Ellie Melloch Goldberg, founder and director of Kids Kicking Cancer, who is also named as a CNN hero of 2014 and somewhat surprisingly uh, a first degree black belt. Tell me how it is that you became interested in martial arts. Every rabbi has to know how to break his board. That was the real reason, but I grew up as a small kid, believe it or not, in the Bronx. So this was about self-preservation? Initially, but then when I became a Rav, I realized I needed an outlet for stress and exercise together, and this really afforded a great opportunity. I found that the more I actually worked out in the course of a week, I had more focus in learning, davening, and dealing with a synagogue. So, That's very interesting. Now tell me when you decided to put 
Marsh, how you decided to make the combination of martial arts. I understand you started that at Camp Simcha first to help kids who were undergoing difficult uh, health situations. Well, our first teacher was our first child, Allah Shalom. She was diagnosed before her first birthday, and at two years old, she would tell the kids in the infirmary that uh, at UCLA, she would tell the kids in the clinic, don't cry, and uh, tell the docs, no medication today, please. And unfortunately, none of those children healed. And a number of years later, I found myself directing Camp Simcha for the High Lifeline. And there I came upon a five-year-old child in the, in the infirmary being held down. The nurses are great. They tried to distract him, but nothing was working, and the chemo wasn't negotiable. So two nurses are holding him down. Another nurse has a large syringe to plunge into his chest. And I walked into the scene. I was the camp director. He was screaming something awful. And it was so counterintuitive to me. I just yelled, wait. And they all stopped. Even the child stopped screaming. And they looked at me. And I have a clue what I was going to say next. And I just said to the nurses, could you give me five minutes with this child? And the nurses were happy to leave. And the little boy looked at me like I was the governor. I just stayed his execution. And I walked to this child and I said, you know, I'm a black belt, which doesn't mean anything. So look at it, it's a wow. I said, could I teach you some karate? He almost jumped off the table. I explained to him the martial arts, you learn that pain's a message. You don't have to listen to it. Breathe in this amazing chi, this energy. And it doesn't matter if you call it ki chi, tanagadalam, nishama. We have this amazing power. You could bring in this light and blow out the pain. Watch me. And five minutes later, we're doing a simple Tai Chi breathing technique. 20 minutes later, they pulled out the needle. He looked up at the nurse and he said, did you do it yet? And that's when Kids Kicking Cancer was born. How many branches do you have nationwide right now? So we actually work with children in seven countries. We're in 41 institutions. And our goal is to reach children in pain all across the globe. What do people say when they meet you for the first time? They know about kids kicking cancer. They know that you're helping kids through very difficult situations. And they meet you when they find out the founder of Kids Kicking Cancer is a rabbi with a beard. Well, I never tell them I'm Jewish. So. Well, they must get the name Rabbi Elimelech Goldberg. No, I'm joking. They certainly know. But, you know, there's a certain universal element where people really know that there is this light. And when... Christians or Muslims or all kids, when we start beginning to talk about this light, we always describe we all have one Father in Heaven. And when they resonate with that, it really is very powerful. I actually just wrote a book. And the name of the book is A Perfect God Created an Imperfect World Perfectly. It's 30 life lessons from kids kicking cancer. And in the book, there's a QR code to pick up an audio meditation. I tell people, if you don't know what a QR code is, here's a web link. And if you don't know what a web link is, you probably have no stress in your life anyway. You don't need it. But every time somebody listens to a meditation, the numbers go up in front of the children, letting them know that they're inspiring the world. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Great pleasure.